through the eyes of man, where we open the Bible and we read it. I've seen many people do that in um, in the ministry or uh, you know preaching at church or whatever. I've seen a lot of people just go straight to the Bible and say, "Here's the scripture." They read the scripture, then they teach about it being the law. You know, has built-in definitions. Um, has another. It always has deeper interpretations. There's there's layers and upon layers of interpretation for scriptures in the Bible. Um, they have they have connections to the old te new New Testament scriptures. Have connections to Old Testament stories. Uh, new Testament scriptures have Old Testament scriptures that are connected. I mean, there is so much interconnectivity within the Bible. That's another thing that atheists would. If an atheist were truly open about it and would actually study it and let um, let the Lord guide them through the scriptures, they would see um, the hand of God in the whole thing. It's and it's absolutely amazing um, how God works through that. And he and he even puts you know stories that man can't understand. He puts them in there so that. Um, so that some people will laugh and ridicule. I mean, he wants he wants the pure heart. So he has a he has a veil over some the people that are trusting in man. He puts a veil in between his word and understanding the wisdom and understanding that comes from understanding his word uh, that he gives us. Um, he puts that veil in between them. So that they, so that they can't, um, they can't really see the meaning, and that's why Jesus ripped the veil. That's why the veil ripped. That veil was a physical symbol, symbol of the veil between us. That Jesus ripped it. So if you go to Jesus, Jesus will lead you into all wisdom and understanding. He'll give you the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will teach you all things is what the Bible says. So this is how you get the revealed word, is you depend upon God, you seek God, you seek the revealed word through Jesus. It's the cross. See? The narrow road. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Matthew 11, 30. The narrow road, that's the cross. So when you put, when you use a, a magnifying, I had a magnifying glass somewhere around here, but the cross is like the magnifying glass, okay? That allows you to get this revealed word. And it's interpreted by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it equals. The revealed word always leads to grace. Always. It always starts. It, it, it's seen through the cross. And it comes back to the cross. Okay? And it's always the message I find all the time through, through the process is love. It almost always comes back to Jesus' love for us. And there's always a revealed word. There's always a revealed word. Every time you wake up, there's a revealed word of God that day. And, and actually, if you pray for it to be unlimited, it, you can get it all day long. And it just, you know, it'll just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. But you got to seek it. Okay? Prayer, meditation through the church, through vid watching this video. That's one way you get the strength of the revealed word usually reflects the strength of the relationship. Relationships. Relationship with Jesus. The strength of the word, the power of the word is dependent upon your connection with Jesus. The power of your Holy Spirit. The power of the, the Holy Spirit you've given into your life. Like I've given 100% of my life to the Holy Spirit and I'm getting massive revelation. And massive revelation, just one after another, you know. And the revealed word builds faith and is an experience of love and grace. It is the manna, the bread of life. It's Jesus in your life. It is Jesus revealing himself to you personally in your life and his love for you. And it's it it is the it is the physical spiritual manna that you need to survive and to be blessed. When you get into this revealed word and you seek this revealed word, it just gives you power, more power, more power.
a lot of bad things happen. And a lot of bad things happen to Christians. But it's not meant to be, I'm telling you right now. If there's, if there's bad things happening to Christians, it is because they're limiting God. They are doubting His Word. They're not relying 100% on His Word. That if, if you're physically sick, you're not relying on Isaiah 53, which says, By His stripes we're healed. Now, it might be a family curse that you haven't dealt with. It might be something happened because you're connected spiritually in a church body. Because there's a lot of sick churches out there. The body is sick. The body of Christ is sick right now. And it's not filled with joy. It's not filled... I mean, there's some good churches, and, and it's, there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a movement around the world, a revival, so to speak. Uh, but there's also a lot of judgment happening right now um, where the Holy Spirit's not allowed. And, and there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of negativity in the church. There's a lot of sickness. There's a lot of people that aren't teaching grace. There's people teaching partial healing, which is partial law, partial grace. And when you, when you teach partial healing, Joseph Prince has a really good sermon on this, um, really good teaching on partial healing. It's like, why are there sick people at church? And, you know, he, he talks about, um, some people were criticizing him because why aren't you having more healing services? Well, he said that, you know, healing services are good and you know, bless healing services. But if that's all you're doing, is if all you're doing is coming together to church to heal, heal people and stuff, then that means, uh, that means your church is sick. That mean, and if your church is sick, it means they're not relying upon the covenant, the blessing of Abraham, where, you know, the divine covenant that the, that you're entitled to as a child of God and an heir to Abraham's blessing, original covenant, perfect health is one of them. That's why he lived so long. That's why he fathered a child at 99, 100 years old. And Sarah was 90. That, because it's perfect health. You're entitled to that. You're entitled perfect health. You're entitled to renew, renew your youth as you age. And if you're not relying on the scriptures, if you're getting sick, and you're not relying on the scriptures and you're going out and getting a prescription. I mean, I'm not against prescription drugs. I'm not against um, doctors. You know, there's doctors that are in the kingdom. There's people that are uh, ministering that way uh, through the use of, of prescription drugs and all that. But we're not called to be under any bondage whatsoever. So the, the strength of your relationship, there's an issue there. Get stronger in the Lord get that out of you, okay, because you're not meant to be sick. Now, some people in the body are sick for the purpose of re of revealing God to someone else, to remove God. I mean, where, not to remove God, but to reveal God through the miracle of getting better, of healing. So there's some people that are sick because of that. That you know that reminds me of the woman uh, with the spirit of infirmity. You know why was she sick? Why was she infirm? Why was she bent over, looking at the ground, staring at the dust of everybody's feet? Why was she like that for 18 years? Why was the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, or you know what have you? The the reasons they were suffering under those uh, disabilities was to manifest Jesus' glory when Jesus came and healed them. And to, so that they would be stories that we would rely upon today. So that was the, to reveal the glory of God. So some people are sick to reveal the glory of God. But you've got to get into the Word. You've got to get into the relationship. You've got to seek Christ. And He will restore you and make you whole. Trust me. But God is a just God. Okay? Blessings, cursings. That's the only two things that there are in life. Blessings and cursings. That's it. That's what the Bible says. It says blessings, cursings. The old law, eye for an eye. Life, blessing, death, cursing. Justice, there's scales of balance. There has to be balance to everything. Okay? There's man on one side, God on the other. That's why Jesus was the Son of Man. Jesus was the Son of God. 
He had to balance the scales forever. He balanced them. He balanced them with the cross. Actually, he counterweighted it to the cross. He, he shifted it 100% to God and made it spiritual, grace, and faith. Okay? Man is physical doubt, fear. Okay? What you sow, you will reap. The law of sowing and reaping. That is part of the law of grace. That is what we're under. What you sow to, you will reap. Okay? If you sow by getting into the Word, then you're going to reap the blessings of the Word applying to your life. Like I was talking about, you want good health? You need to focus on the blessing of Abraham and Sarah and the restoring that covenant with yourself or with your family. Um, you need to sow into that. Sow into it. And, and tell you the truth, the best way you can sow is by serving others. Serve others and that, that you will reap. We'll get into this a little bit, but Isaiah 58, you will reap the glory of God. That is your reward. The glory of God is your reward. And isn't that wonderful? That the, the silver and gold of today's standard is the glory of God. See, the silver and gold in Solomon's temple, that was the glory of man. Okay? The glory of God is spiritual. And, it, and it, uh, it's manifested in the physical, in the circumstances that you're pulled out of, or, or the healing that manifests in the church, or amongst your friends, or what have you. It's free will, our choice. We can choose blessings, we can choose cursings, sowing and reaping. We can choose to sow, we can choose to reap. You know, we, can, we can choose to reap by sowing. If you want to reap death and destruction, then sow to the devil, because that's what he's all about. If you want to reap life, blessings, grace, perfect health, divine purpose, plan, uh, blessings beyond belief, unlimited, sow unlimited to God. Ask God to let you sow unlimited to Him, 100% to Him. See, that's what this is over here, this body. If you're only 10%, this is what we're required under the law. Because if you're not under grace, you are under the law. Okay? That's what the Paul talked about. If you don't, if you fall from grace and, and you're not under grace, then you're under the law. Everybody in sin and bondage is under the law. Okay? So when they when they sow sin and bondage, they reap death and destruction because they're still under the law. And if if you if you give all yourself and the other thing, too, here, what I was getting to is the 10% is what we're required to give to God under the law. So if you're not giving 10% to the church or the ministry of the body of Christ, you're under the law and you're stealing. You're stealing from God. This is important to remove financial curses, okay? Because if you want to remove the financial curse under the law, make sure you give more than 10%. Now, what God says... In, in the Bible, Malachi, he says that uh, if um, if you give if you give ten percent, you can test him in in this. You can test him in tithing. That's one thing we can test him in. And what I found through that is I started giving ten percent, and you get a hundredfold increase. Okay. So you give ten dollars, you receive a thousand. And and I tested him early on, but then after he proved it to me two or three times, uh, I said, "Okay, God. This means that if I'm if I'm just giving you ten percent and you're giving me a hundredfold increase, what are you going to do if I give twenty five percent? What are you going to do if I give fifty percent? What are you going to do if I give seventy five percent?" If I'm getting hundredfold in increase for ten percent, what do you, what is, what is twenty five fifty? What I mean, you're turning ten dollars into a thousand. Why well, I don't want to hold back. I want to give you everything, and so that's what I learned really quick. What six months he proved the tithing to me. So then I just said, okay, I'm I'm all in. You got me hundred percent because I want unlimited grace and favor. I want unlimited grace because I, I, you proved it. You proved 
to me that your word is is 100 percent true that you'll give me a hundredfold increase for 10 percent so then i went all in and i mean I'm, i can't explain to you how blessed i am and it, i'm not talking financially a lot of times when actually when i shifted my focus when i saw that ten dollars would make a thousand and and that he would do that hundredfold increase i was kind of convicted that I was limiting him by just giving him 10%. I was convicted hard and I was like, look, and it's and it quickly turned from a money game to a finance to a holistic prosperity, a peace, joy, happiness that you can't describe. I mean, how valuable is the peace of God in your life? To be able to face any trial, any any problem in your life, but to have the peace of God and not have to worry and and how much is how how valuable is this to live on the Elk River and realize my dream and be a musky fisherman and have be able to go kayaking and have a wonderful dog and a wonderful son and family and that that I know is saved saved and secure and going to be um, going to be there in the kingdom uh, of heaven. Uh, you know how valuable is that? So I'm a, I, I quickly realized that I'm a millionaire many times over, and that none of that's really important. That the most important thing is getting people, getting people to sow to the spirit, getting people sowing to the spirit. That's what this sowing to man. We can sow to man. It results in cursing, physical suffering, spiritual suffering, lack of peace, lack of joy, lack of love. Eternal death. It's all sin and death. Sin and death. You want to die? So to man. So to man. You want to die? You want to die in your sins? You want cursed? You want no peace, no joy, no love? You want eternal damnation, eternal death? So to man. And I'll tell you right now that that's what you're going to get. Because Sowing and reaping is the law of grace. Now, if you want, if you want, if you want grace, you sow to the Spirit. Okay, the cross is the cross is where the best of God met the worst of man. The best of God met the worst of man at the cross. That was the worst of man. Killing an innocent person. Killing the Son of God, the King of the Jews, the, the King of all creation. They killed God. Killed Him. And all He did was teach love, peace, happiness. Loving, He taught those four things. The four basic laws of Jesus. This is what Jesus taught. This is what he was killed for, people. Not really, but... <laughs> I mean, this is his teachings that he was taken to the cross for. Love God, love your neighbor, be his children, and serve others. Try to find fault with this. Try to find a teaching that is contrary to this. Try to find a fifth category. I dare you. Because I've tried to do, I've tried to do it, and... and you know, I'm I'm a lawyer by training, so, so I did. I mean, I did a pretty exhaustive search and research, and I tried to find something that would contrast or co be contrary to this. That's you know, the, it's like the scientific method. You you come up with a theory, then you test that theory. Okay, this has been tested, a tested theory. Every one of his teachings fits in one of these categories, and there is no fifth category. And you can put everything he taught into one of these four categories. So, so he's a just God. And right here, sow to the Spirit. You will bear the fruits of the Spirit. Blessings, provision, increase, love, joy, peace, eternal life. Long-suffering, joy, happiness. Now this is the body of Christ. This is when you receive Jesus, 
you become part of the body. When you're born again spiritually and given the gift of the Holy Spirit is when you technically become a member of the body. But there's many people limiting God. Remember how I showed you the body with 10%? We're, every, every person that's within this body, the body of Jesus Christ, which is the new temple. This is the new temple. This is where we're all, where Jesus broke down the physical uh, limitations of the earthly realm of, the, of man. He broke down those physical limitations and he became the temple of God. And he gave us all the ability to be sons of God, like him, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through him. Through Jesus Christ. Okay? Through his death on the cross, we became sons of God. We became righteous through that. Not through anything we could do. We're not righteous. The only way we can become righteous is by focusing on Jesus and having the wedding garment, the wedding garment that Jesus talked about, which is His Holy Spirit, which is the same Holy Spirit that led Him to conquer sin and death. That same Spirit is available to you and me. It's dependent upon how much we give it. How much we sow to the Spirit is how much we receive from the Spirit. So we are meant to be overf overflowing with grace and overflowing with blessing and overflowing we are meant to be unlimited 100% unlimited like over and above any percentages numbers of infinity is you know if you put a number on it in infinite there is no end to his grace it is unlimited his love is unlimited for us and we are to be unlimited for him now the more we receive that power of the Holy Spirit to become unlimited, the more the fruits are going to be conveyed through us and through our ministry. And the more people are going to be drawn to us and to get the work done that needs to be done. Um, because the work of faith, works, works of faith, come from the power of the Holy Spirit. Like I can do nothing without the Holy Spirit that indwells in me. And that, that indwelling in the Holy Spirit is what makes me righteous before God. If it, I, I would not, I'm not righteous on my own. I don't have a covering unless I've given my life to Christ because His, His body on the cross is the covering, is the wedding garment. The Holy Spirit is what, when I, when I go before God, I can only go before God because Jesus and His Holy Spirit has been given to me. Okay? It's not me that makes we can't we can't become righteous on our own. We have to focus on the cross and the relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we are blessed with the power of the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit makes us righteous. And then the Holy Spirit manifests works of righteousness, works of faith through our life. And it's all for God's glory. That is our reward. There's no financial reward. There's no, uh, there's no physical reward other than God's glory. Okay? Now, yes, we get blessed. We get blessed with all those things. But it's for God's glory. It, it's all for God's glory. But, but the cross, you know, the cross was for God's glory. And, um, you know, we... But the body has jobs, Okay? And you need to figure out what your pur what the purpose and plan for your life is with the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you by seeking God and finding out. But the body has eyes, the body has ears, mouth to speak, ears to hear, eyes to see, heart to love, to serve, hands to heal, arms to reach, legs to carry, feet to move, bell to ring, hair to dry. That, that's based on you know Mary drying his feet with her hair. Um, blood to sanctify the blood is what the blood is the power the blood is the, that's why every, that's why he died from uh, bleeding out he, he, he died from blood loss because of the stripes and every one of those stripes healed us healed us 100% but it, to sanctify the sweat to cleanse the tears to wash 
the cross, like I said, the magnifying glass, because you need to look, you need to look through the cross with everything you, with, when you're seeking God, you always look at it through the cross, through the perspective of the cross. The church, to fellowship, to organize, to communicate, congregate, to edify. Okay, the church should be edifying Christ, edifying grace. So that's our jobs. Now, to the scripture lesson. And I'm being long-winded as usual, but uh, I'll try to summarize this pretty, pretty, um, a little faster. I get, uh, I talk a lot. Some people criticize me for that, but I've got a lot to say, you know. And I really do believe, like I was talking about early on, when between judging and discerning, uh, we we are to call we are called to receive the Holy Spirit, okay? And the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the the spirit the um, the gift of discernment. It's a spiritual gift that is given to us, where we can discern the teachings of people, and we can discern the spirit behind the teachings. And it's um it's it's a it's similar to judging, but you're not. You're not making a judgment on their uh, their eternal salvation or lack thereof. What you're doing is you're making a, a a discernment of their teaching of the spirit that's behind their teaching, and and you're making the decision whether or not it's edifying, whether it's beneficial, whether it's encouraging, whether it's lifting up whether it's directed by the Holy Spirit. And the very first thing, uh, that sh the very num the number one way to discern is first of all to have the knowledge and wisdom of the Scriptures and to have the power of the Holy Spirit to discern. But if you, if you notice any teaching that is contrary to the Scriptures, then you know that, that's, uh, that that person has not either received the knowledge of wisdom or understanding. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, I mean, we're not, nobody's perfect except Jesus. Jesus was the only one that ever became perfect. And uh, anyway, uh, he's the only one that became perfect. And the way he became perfect was through the power of the Holy Spirit, which goes to Matthew 4.4. 4, when the devil, right after he received the Holy Spirit, he went to the wilderness and he used the scriptures to rebuke the devil. When the devil was telling him to turn a rock into bread, he said that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay? So that was Matthew 4.4. 4. Matthew 8.8 8 is the power of the word. Okay, the centurion. We don't know much about the centurion, but we do know that he needed healing for his servant. We know that. And we do know that he had faith. He didn't feel worthy of that faith, but he asked, he said, speak a word and my servant will be healed. That shows the power of God. Okay? Isaiah 58. Beautiful, beautiful uh, scripture. The whole thing, uh, verses 1 to 14, it shows what God really considers fasting is serving others. Okay? and that So that's what I'm going to end with, is Isaiah 58. Um, because we've been teaching about, or we've been talking at church about... Um, We've been talking about fasting, and you know I I believe in fasting. I have fasted before, um, but I've been directed by the Holy Spirit to do that fast, and I believe that's the only time that it will bear fruit is if the if it's the Holy Spirit's behind it um, and directing it. Now in Isaiah 58, it shows the heart of God. And, and it, it talks about fasting. Isaiah was saying that 
true fasting to God. If you really want to hear from God, here's what you do. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Spare not. Cry out. Spare not. Spare not. Don't hold back. Okay? Tell my people their transgressions. And the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. So he was saying they're, they're in their transgressions, they're in their sins, but they're still seeking God daily. As a nation that did righteousness, like, it, they're trying to act like they're righteous because they're seeking God. Okay, but they have sins and transgressions. They're letting people suffer. And did not forsake the ordinance of God. Like, they're, they're righteous, and their ancestors, and, and they did, they lived up to the life, or to the... Not the life, the, they lived up to the law. They're trying to say they're, they lived up to the law. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? So God was ignoring their fasting. Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? They're, they think they're afflicting themselves and they're sacrificing and God's not noticing. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. And exploit all your laborers. So they were, even though they were fasting, they were exploiting their workers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. They were, you know, struggling, strive, you know, with strife and debate. And to strike with the fist of wickedness. Then they were, you know, being wicked, making money and destroying people. You will not fast as you do this day. To make your voice heard on high, is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? So they were doing wicked, but they were fasting. Doing wicked, fasting. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of the wickedness. To undo heavy burdens. So he's saying instead of doing wicked and then fasting, why don't you destroy the bonds of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens. Take the burden of sin off of people. To let the oppressed go free. The oppressed are the sin, the 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 sinful, the you know, the wicked. They're out there sinning, they're oppressed. Or, or, you know, there's all kinds of types of oppression, but it's of the devil. And that to, but to free the oppressed. Is it not to share? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? So instead of fasting, go share your bread with the hungry. Help the oppressed. Help get wicked. The help remove the bonds of wickedness. And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. Bring to your house the poor that are cast out. So feed the poor, help the poor, teach the poor. When you see the naked, that you cover them. Clothe people and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your delight shall break forth like the morning. Your delight will break forth, okay? Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. Righteousness going before you. That's the Holy Spirit will go before you. And pave your way. Oh, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. So you will cry and he, God will reveal the glory. God will say, here I am. What is it you need? If you take away the yoke of your midst, the pointing of your finger, that's the judgment, pointing of your finger, and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, that's the spiritual hungry too. That's preaching the word. That's teaching. It's also, you know, physical food. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness. And your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters did not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places 
You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So praise God. That's what we are called to do, is serve others. It was right here. It's the silver and the gold of the new covenant. Okay? Serve others. Love God. Love your neighbor. Be his children. Serve others. You can't find fault with this. You cannot find it.